Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires, and this is Couch Riffs episode number 117. With my guest, Dave Knudsen, of the now defunct, incredible, legendary bands, Minus the Bear and Botch. The mighty Botch. You've heard me talk about Botch before. God, they were fucking amazing. Uh, so, uh... Dave's a real, he's like a, a wizard, man. He's like a magical magician on the guitar. You should, if you, for some reason, have not heard either of these bands, you should stop, go listen to them right now, and then come back and listen to this episode. Because you'll, um, yeah, you'll have a better day for it. Trust me. Dave's working on a solo record. Should be out, uh, I think, maybe... You know, it's been two weeks since we recorded this episode, so I think that he said he was going to be releasing it next year. I'm excited to hear that. Very excited. Um, And I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I hope you guys do, too. Listen, if you enjoy the Couchers podcast, why don't you support the Couchers podcast? Super easy. You just go over there to anchor.fm, search for Couchers, or follow the link that's right in this episode. And you can sign up there for uh, to support us for as little as 99 cents a month. And this is how the podcast keeps going. It's how the podcast keeps getting great guests. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts around it. That's how it happens. Um, I really appreciate everyone that has been supporting. Uh, you guys are the best. I appreciate all the messages that I get. Um, I am listening and I, you know, like I've even gotten some guests that people have suggested and, uh, and I follow through on most all of those. So I appreciate all that stuff. So listen, right now I want to thank the folks who have been, uh, supporting the podcast. So listen, thank you. Uh, Ryan Waters, Hayden Smith, Ryan Hooper, Matt Gabs, Justin Jones, Doug Starkovic, Deja Colin Tuono, Rochelle Parker, Chris Smith. Adam Pranica, Dan Hurst, James Pope, S.J. Somerset Sullivan, Mike Lacerda, Ryan Crace, Steve Hall, Jamie McParland, Dan Leary, Kathy Giordano, Rebecca Pellman, Danny Bland, Soto Rebellos, John Guffey, uh, Justice Gash, uh, Teresa Morgan, Rolla Amplifiers, Perry Morgan, and thank you all. As always, to our good friends, River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington. Now, River City Guitars is a uh, small but mighty guitar store in Spokane, Washington. RiverCityGuitars.com. Go check them out. Follow them on uh, social media. They, you know, they get stuff in. It goes up on social media. People buy it. Sometimes they're buying it before it can even hit the website. Uh, things are moving fast. They're always buying. If you have something, a cool vintage or just a cool used piece, like an amp or a guitar or some effects, something that you are just, it's collecting dust, you want to get rid of it or you need a little pocket cash, give them a call. It, they are always buying, okay? So you can give them a phone call at 509-818-7693. Tell them Squire sent you, or drop him an email, sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. All right, uh, every week I pick a little something off the website. This week, uh, we're going to go with an amp, okay? It's a, an 80s, must be late 80s, uh, Marshall Silver Jubilee 212 combo. Now this thing, people go bananas for these things, you know? They go absolutely bananas, Enough that Marshall, you know, reissued them. Uh, but this ain't no reissue. This is a real deal right here. This is a real deal holy field. Uh, you can have this one, this beautiful combo, for $18.99 plus shipping. Uh, and uh, you'll find it over there at rivercityguitars.com. Okay? Listen, thank you again. Please support the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I swear to God, it's what keeps this thing going. That's, that is what makes this happen. Um, 
Remember the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Don't be a dick to each other, you know? We're getting close to to election time, very close, and uh, people are all worked up. You know, you don't have to get worked up. You just don't. You don't have to get worked up. You can just go out and vote and be kind to each other. And don't be a dick. There we go. Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me all Great. right? That was so weird. Uh, I I rolled your email in there and three different contacts pop up. Oh, yeah. It was weird. And then I couldn't get Skype to find your info, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. How you doing, man? Thanks for uh, starting a little bit late. Like, oh. I got home at, at 7.30. And I was, I I work in coffee. Yeah, I saw from your uh, your signature email signature. Oh yeah. Um, so I brewed four hundred gallons of iced coffee today. Wow. But that's uh, a- like five gallons at a time. That's insane. It was a it was a lot, but it's uh, maple sweetened. And this will be a funny way to to start. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried, I, I, st- I rolled out a new technique that I thought was going to be a real time saver. You know, I thought I was going to yeah. be real efficient. And uh, I have to put, you know, like seven and a half gallons of maple syrup, which is a lot of maple syrup if you consider, you know, <laughs> how much five gallons is, uh, into this giant, like, stainless steel conical and uh it's back pressured and so i have to, i have opened this valve up so that it back pressures and i you know, it releases and i can open open this tank up and put the maple in and uh it was the first time i'd done it i forgot to close the valve on the bottom and just dumped maple all over the floor and i had to do it twice today and i was like well you know that's a mistake you only make once but guess what guess what <laughs> I fucking did it on the second one too. Really? Yeah, I don't know what the shit I was thinking, man. I just my head wasn't in the game. Well, now you know, third time's a charm, I suppose. I, I mean, I'm not gonna say that because clearly <laughs> I can prove myself wrong. Absolutely. But surely, in all your years of touring, there's been something that you've you've said you've done something so poorly that you thought to yourself well how could i possibly do that again yeah absolutely undoubtedly there's a there's a i mean there's quite a few of those moments i suppose (laughs) i think most of them involve like traveling or making poor decisions about like you know where you're eating someday and you like swear Mm -hmm. off x restaurant and then all of a sudden you're in the next town and it's like that's the only place by the venue that you can eat and it's like no right (laughs) Or there's that, uh, you know, you're you're on a bus in Europe, and you're like, all right, well, there's a festival over here out of route, so we'll fly in for that one, and it's an early morning flight, and you have a terrible day. Yeah. Consequently, you have a terrible show, and you're like, well, we're never going to do that again. I mean, but- we definitely, yeah, <laughs> the yeah, the routing. I guess one of the things we learned, uh, and it took us quite a few times, I think, was the uh, the warm up shows before you get to the big markets, you know, like <clears throat> sometimes you got to start a tour in LA or New York or Philly or something like that. Right. But man, if you can start in um, like Spokane, Washington and work your way down <laughs> or go right. through Idaho and get somewhere that uh, <laughs> you're a whole hell of a lot tighter when you get to the, the big markets, no offense to Spokane or Idaho, but sure. They, they know where they live. <laughs> well, also like, you know, there aren't a bunch of big publications there that are going to tear you a new asshole if you if you don't come out sh- shredding. True faces. enough. Yes, absolutely. Although the bar these days, everyone's you know, no, no matter what you do, it's going to end up on the internet. Yeah, I mean, it, you're right. Yeah, it could get picked up and <laughs> be, have a life of its own. That story of the, of the show in Bozeman, Montana, that <laughs> went awry. Right, for sure. Uh, so I have a question for you because, um, uh, I, 
I hope I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here's my first question for you. My 90s timeline is pretty soggy. Okay. Uh, I'm better now. But <laughs> I didn't re- I don't really have a solid timeline, a chain of events for most of the 90s. I remember everything that happened, but my my ability to recall the, what order it happened in or anything like that. But uh, I saw B- Botch play, and okay. I swear it was, and it was a, uh, it was a pretty, you know, I wasn't a hardcore kid. I grew up in a little town. I grew up in Granite Falls, and I, I don't know if you know where that is. I don't. Where is it? Uh, do you know Buckley? I'm trying to think of a town that's like, because you're from <clears throat> Tacoma, right? Yeah. I'm trying to think of a town like granite falls that it was a uh, population 1000 maybe 1200 when i lived there it's bigger now but like a little logging town um east of everett oh okay all right east of everett up by lake stevens arlington i've heard of of buckley i suppose a buckley was is just a a town like granite falls but in like in the south end right right okay um so I wasn't you know, like I wasn't a hardcore kid. I was exposed to some punk rock, but there were a few things that came along and got on my radar that just like changed my course. Um, one of those things was Drive Like Jehu, and another one yep. of those things was was Botch. And I think the only reason was I ended up at a show somehow at at the break room, and um, yeah, we and. When I went back and tried to f- figure out when that was, everything would indicate that it was like late 90s, but I swear that it was 95 or 96. I don't think I was playing guitars in bands yet. I think I was playing bass still. If we if it was at the break room, then it was probably one of our very... F- so back, you know, at the beginning of Botch, we had a strict all ages only policy. Yeah, um, we wouldn't play any shows that were 21 plus or anything like that, just because we wanted, you know, we loved the energy from all the kids, and we didn't want to exclude people, and we wanted to to play for everyone. But um, at, towards the end of the 90s, 90s, um, <clears throat> you know, the the shows got bigger, and we realized we got offers. You know, you can play an all ages show, and then after that, play a 21 plus show. Right. And I'm and I'm guessing that the break room. I remember a break room. A, a night where we played two shows and we did that and we split it. So I'm guessing that must have been like, I'm guessing it was probably after Romans came out. So this may have, this may actually be 2000. This may not actually be nineties at all. I don't, I mean, if my, if my brain is, is right. What, what was the show? Like here is something that I feel like, I feel like it w- like that, it, it could have been a split show. Uh huh. Do you remember who? Were we opening for anyone, or was it just us the, headline? I feel like it was a special occasion, and either it could have been an all ages and a night show. It could have been a a private party, but I feel like you guys were opening for someone, and I feel like I I distinctly recall, even in my drunken stupor, like I was like I I feel sorry for. I feel sorry for whoever it was that was was going after. Because we play, we also played some shows at Graceland with like opening for like Neurosis and stuff like that, where we would play an all ages and a uh, and a twenty one plus show. But the break room, I only recall playing there that time that we did the the split show, the the double show in one night. Maybe that maybe that's it. Here was one detail that I remember. Okay. Because okay. I was like, how the fuck does someone end up at at this place musically? Like I was trying, I was still trying to wrap my head, and I, you know, I was into some some stuff that was like, you know, more some complex music. Like mm-hmm. I was into King Crimson and Bitches Brew and uh, Nels Klein Trio and some no. like, uh, but then you guys. I th- I feel like, and I might be imagining this. I swear to God, you guys covered 
Master of Puppets as an encore. Is that true? <laughs> no, 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 no. No? I, no, we never... The only songs we covered were uh, Carl Orff's O Fortuna, which was recorded one, which was recorded back in like 96. And then we we covered um, the B-52's Rock Lobster. <laughs> <laughs> there was no Metallica covers, but no. I wish we could have. Oh, I'm pretty certain that you could if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, part of my... I, I'm trying to figure it out, trying we'll to remember. Piece, yeah, we'll piece it together, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. But uh, but on, I guess on that subject... I'd never heard anyone play guitar like like you play guitar. And furthermore, like as you developed more in uh, Minus the Bear, uh, it got in some ways like more intense and more precise. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, the intensity shifted from maybe uh, in Botch where it was it's technical and you know and it's complex and it's difficult to play but at the same time when it's on stage um the idea is to you know create energy through you know the movement and the thrashing around and the stage diving with your guitar and the just going you know treating your guitar like it's meant to be abused you know sure. um and so i you know that intensity then shifted like you you know pointed out into something that was a little more uh you know inward and uh you know took the performance to a different a different kind of performance you know it just it shifted a little bit um because you know as we got older it was like you know i guess as you know our musical tastes evolved and it, we all kind of went our own ways well yeah your your ears take a lot of punishment right oh yeah yeah <laughs> and your no body. Ear no, no earplugs standing right next to the cymbals, jumping in the crowd. I mean, this, this, you know, going to the ER after shows because you've been, you know, cut your forehead open by stage diving and then some guy jumps on top of you and your tuning pegs gash your forehead open. Um, but then you got to play and it looks so awesome when you're just <laughs> <laughs> covered in blood. blood, pouring blood out of your forehead during the second song. You still have the rest of the show to play. <laughs> I love black guitars so much, but blood just doesn't show up on them very well. Yeah, seriously, yeah, you gotta get a lighter color, man. <laughs> Red guitars too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the um, I went, you know, I went back. I had a, like I mentioned before, I had a long day at work, and so. Uh, I I think I I might have. I might have listened to your entire catalog today. Wow. Just like to get me through the day, right? To from 8 a.m. when I started till I left work at 7.15. Um, and I forgot how dynamic, because, you know, you think about botch and you just think it's just like, like a hammer, like a very, you know, uh, like a hammer that's building some, some pretty fancy architecture, but (laughs) it's a fucking hammer. Right. There was a, there was a lot going on there that I think when I was listening to it, then I don't think I was maybe smart enough to understand like there are bands that i am not talented enough to play in and then there are bands that i'm not maybe uh you know prepared to enjoy to its fullest and today maybe it's because i was listening on good headphones you know um i noticed those things and it it surprised me how how much detail and the recordings are fucking dynamite too oh yeah i mean matt did a matt bale is an amazing job i mean i think the point that you're getting at is like maybe for records that were made back then or for you know your first um characterization of the band is just a heavy noisy hardcore metal band but um but in there you know you everything can't just be louder 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 without going quiet at some point right you know you need the dynamics to really 
kick the listener in the ass. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those um, quieter passages, I guess, were meant to do that. But it was also meant to just give the song more of a um, more character. You know, like, I guess, you know, when we started playing, we wanted to start playing because we were really into, like, all this straight edge hardcore stuff. Right. And everything was like chugga, chugga, chugga. And every part had to be heavier than the next one. And everything was really simple and straightforward. And while that's what kind of got us into playing music, that gets really boring really quick. And so, you know, you, you mentioned Drive Like Jehu earlier, and I mean, that was one of my biggest guitar influences. Mm -hmm. You know, those records, you know, really opened my eyes in terms of what else you can do with a guitar, because up till that point, I was more of a metal kid or a hardcore kid. And that's just like a splintering off into a different realm that can get a lot more angular it can get a lot more interesting it can really like show the you know dynamics of what you can do with a guitar um you know and i think botch resulted from a lot of those different influences whether it was like mashuga you know or going to like a unwound or like some you know like indie band that um it's maybe more on like the noise rock tip that um you know, doesn't palm mute every section of their, right. of, the, of their riffs. Right. So I mean, all those influence coming together and, you know, like I said earlier, that's why the, you know, the quiet parts, you need to have those quiet parts to, to make the, the loud ones really scream at you. Even the loud parts had a lot more detail, um, that I had never noticed before. Just maybe, and it just was, uh, it, it was a lot more, and this will sound like a backhanded compliment maybe, but it just seemed like a lot more thoughtful than I ever thought that it was before. <laughs> like there was a lot put behind the music. It was, it was very uh, deep. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome to hear. It, it's, I mean, it's honestly, it's really flattering to hear that people are still listening and care about those records. I mean, I was texting with Brian the other day and it was like, man, like, the first LP came out 23 years ago and, you know, Romans is like 21 years, you know, that's like came out 21 years ago. I mean, it's, it's insane that it, the longevity that it's had and the, you know, it's flattering that people still, still adore it and it's still regarded as a, as a good record. I mean, we had no idea that that would, if you told us back then, we would be like, you're shitting me. Like no one's going to listen to this <laughs> <laughs> <it> alone <laughs> in the future. So, um, but I think, you know, Tim, our drummer, came from, uh, a, you know, a jazz drummer background. And I think, you know, kind of like Dillinger did and a lot of the the bands that we toured with kind of drew those other influences um, to, you know, that made it more intricate and created, uh, you know, he, he helped create a lot of the weird time signature stuff. You know, like he would say, I learned this trick about this polyrhythm or we're going to do this you know, we're going to shift this beat around here and there. And, um, you know, that was new to a lot of like, you know, to like Brian and I, um, but we were all just learning together and just trying to really make music that we thought was interesting and would, would challenge us. Like we always, we always wanted to write mosh parts that you couldn't really mosh to because they weren't like on the right beat. <laughs> you know, we wanted like, we wanted to confuse the kids that were, that were like in the pit that were dumb, that were just there trying to do windmills. Uh, we, wanted to, we wanted you to like, you know, like mosh thoughtfully, you know, like, like think about this time signature that we're doing this in. Do you understand? <laughs> Interpretive mosh. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> So you had never, you weren't into any progressive music oh, no. at all. Well, that's not true. I mean, I was a huge, I guess I hadn't done it in practice, yeah. you know, like I hadn't studied it, but you know, obviously like I was a slave to like Metallica and Slayer tablature and Morbid Angel stuff. I mean, I would just like woodshed those riffs constantly. And, you know, when I was growing up, so I mean, a lot of that stuff is, you know, fairly can get pretty complex when you're talking about like injustice for all or master of puppets and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it was, that was definitely the technical part definitely intrigued me. And that was, I guess why, you know, initially when we started off kind of just as a dumb hardcore for lack of better word, I'm not insulting hardcore or <laughs> mosh or whatever, but you know, like that's why it evolved as it did. I think because people realized we realized that, that, that was kind of what we were interested in, what was interesting. Were you into any of the East Coast 
uh, straight edge bands? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Snapcase and. Um... Do you know the 108? Uh, I never met any of those people, but, uh, mm. but I obviously, I mean, I've, I've seen them and I know the band obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the folks that started equal vision are my fucking neighbors here. Now I live in a town of like 25 people. And, really? Huh? Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. They live up here. We live between Hudson and, and Albany, New York. Huh. Yeah, I mean, all that all that Equal Vision stuff was, you know, it was like that stuff, and then it was like the Victory stuff and the Revelation stuff, and um, yeah, I mean, I think we were all like fed off a steady diet of that in the beginning. I mean, anytime one of those bands, you just say that you're on that label, and then every kid, you know, that <laughs> comes out to that show, you know, even though they've never heard the band, you know, it's like that's kind of like the marketing for right. for the band back then. It's like what label you're on and who who you're associated with. Do you think that's? I mean, that doesn't happen like that anymore, does it? I mean, it, the world has I mean, changed so much. Well, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you would, because I mean, labels. Yeah, yeah I don't know. And I mean, I'm kind of out of the loop, but I mean, there's probably some sort of social media aspect of that 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 right. I'm not aware of or clued in on, where you know, you're whoever you're tied to somehow on social media will. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, back then it was just like even going to the record store, it was like, you know, you see, a, uh, you know, like a, a, a records on like Gravity Records or, you know, Kill Rock Stars or something. And, you know, like, oh, this is going to be up this alley. Like, I love this stuff. I'm going to get it. Yeah, exactly. What was the place on on Broadway in Seattle down at the end? Um, Fallout? Huh? Fallout Records? No, Fallout was great. I, you know, here's the thing about I was because I came from that small town, uh-huh. and I showed up in Seattle, and I just like I was really intimidated, and I just kind of thought if I if I went into those places, like I went in a couple times and looked around, and I was just like, this guy's gonna know I don't know anything, <laughs> you know, he's gonna know I'm a fake. Yeah, to, I mean, I felt that way the first time I wanted to fall out, too. It's like, oh, here, here comes a poser. Here comes a kid from Tacoma. Right. Like, he doesn't know anything. Like, what's he going to buy? Is he going to ask for, like... He's from Tacoma, me? and he doesn't even know seaweed. Get out! <laughs> <laughs> Get out, kid! Get out of here! <laughs> You're banished! <laughs> um, no, uh, Orpheum. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Orpheum turned me on to a lot of stuff. Um. Yeah, for sure. They turned me onto a lot of shit. Yeah, I, or, I mean, I definitely bought stuff at Orpheum, but I mean, Fallout was kind of like the main thing. I mean, we would come up from Tacoma every weekend and then, you know, for a show at like the Velvet Elvis, which is like a little theater down in Pioneer Square, you know, you come up there. Yeah. Yeah. For like the Saturday or the Sunday matinee at two o'clock. And before then you roll into Fallout and you just search to see what the what new records were there. And then. Hopefully they had all the good ones hadn't been bought up by then. And um, I mean, that was a pretty fun time in high school. Just, you know, going to going to little all ages shows and just being exposed to all this new music. And I mean, I guess that's what, you know, that's where the whole it was just cool seeing that whole DIY um, aspect of it and realizing, you know, like you can anyone can go on stage and and make music. I mean, it's not like the exclusive realm of classically trained musicians or people that are that are pop stars on a major label like you can be on a the tiniest label in the world and still release a record and or be have, on no label well yeah exactly exactly yeah for sure yeah i mean it was it was cool those formative years you know all those little shows we went to and going to record stores like fallout or orpheum you know were really a uh, really you know built up who i think botch became as people i still I bought vinyl all through the 90s, which was like a fool's errand then. And now it's back, but... Yeah. Yeah, I, st- I mean, I'm st- I still buy vinyl. I mean, vinyl's awesome. I mean, it's it's yeah. just such a... I mean, you know, I was a, did a lot of graphic design for years and years before um, Minus the Bear took off. You know, I was working at a design firm. And so for me, the whole like tactile aspect 
and the whole packaging surrounding vinyl is just so so great. I mean, I just I just love how deep into the details, you know, like I love reading liner notes. Like I love all those little small things that, you know, you'll never get by just streaming, you know, a song on Spotify. Like back then it was just fun. You know, it was really fun nerding out on all the little details and which studio was this at? And, you know, who was the engineer on this? And um, are there pictures in the, from in the studio? There's nothing yeah. cooler than when you get a record and it's actually a gatefold as well. Okay. The best. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that's why, you know, I mean, I love vinyl for that reason. It just feels like it's permanent. There's a certain amount of like realness to it as well. But the permanence, I think, is something that's that, you know, people latch on to, I think. Right. Yeah. You can yeah. hold it. Yeah. yeah. It's not just a click on something that, you know, you, you don't have any sort of ownership over it. Like it's not part of you at that point, you know? Uh. Yeah, social media. It's I, I I resist to talk shit about social media just because it's a part of everyone's life. Yeah, it's how you. It's a tool. Yeah, absolutely. But um, man, we have re we've been really irresponsible with it as a society. <laughs> You know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Alex, our keyboardist for Minus the Bear, was in town. Uh, from he's living in the UK and he stayed over last night and we were talking about Twitter and it was like I used to go there just for like jokes and comedy and now you go to Twitter and it's just like diving into the worst comments section you could ever possibly like get into you know it's like oh, man it's devolved into you know I, I guess what it is at the moment but yeah it's, it's, Some, oh, it's somehow miraculously you know, it's over because I would go there just for jokes as well. And I basically all I got any social media for, because I, I mean, since MySpace, it was like, sure. You know, after that, I was like, eh, whatever, social media, this is dumb. This is a joke. And uh, my number one comment that I would put on anything that I thought was dumb was uh, insert fart noise, just like in quotes. <laughs> and so that ended up my Twitter handle. And it, I had like, oh, really? Like, yeah, and somehow I had like 300 followers and I got verified. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant. Someone pointed it out to me and I was like, yeah. oh, I don't, what's that mean? Yeah. I still barely know. <laughs> I don't know. It's all, it's all kind of a, kind of a mess. The one thing I'm surprised about and how are you doing all right? 2020 has been a real fucker. Uh, yeah, I'm doing okay. Like, uh, the whole, um, I mean, everyone's healthy in my family and, you know, I have a circle of friends that I hang out with. My wife's job is intact. I've been able to be creative and continue writing a lot of music during this. And, you know, my son's back at quote unquote school at the moment, you know, which means that, you know, he's on a, a Microsoft Teams call for six hours out of the day and, I'm asking him or he's asking me, you know, can you help me with my math or what's this mean or whatever. So, I mean, it's definitely better than the end of last school year when there was like obviously no plan in place and everything was just a clusterfuck and they were throwing whatever they could against the wall to see what stuck. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I can't really, every, so many people have it much worse than me. So I feel like I don't even, I can't even complain because my family's healthy and I'm healthy and, you know, oh, I'm glad to hear that. What about you? Oh, I mean, look, man, I got, you know, I already stated I got to have a job. I yeah. haven't I haven't not worked all year. Um, I did take a pay cut when when the shit hit the fan, you know, before mm -hmm. all the Fed stuff kicked in mm -hmm. really. And in my paranoia, because I was a poor kid, you know, in my yeah. paranoia before the Fed stepped in, I was like, well, I'm not going to fuck around. And I. I definitely overestimated Americans. I was like, I'm going to get a, I am, I've had a full-time job, but half salary. And I was like, well, I'm going to get a second job and I'm going to get a job that I know won't go away. And I'm going to mm -hmm. get it before everyone else either gets laid off or has to find a job. But uh spoiler alert, nobody was looking for a fucking job because, 
<laughs> they were getting unemployment plus $600 fed. And so I got this second full-time job. I was working like 15 or 16 hours a day sometimes, sleeping four hours, four and a half hours at the most a night. And I couldn't quit and get the fed because you can't quit and get un unemployment. So I like in my diligent approach to uh, ha to seek security, I totally screwed myself. You got yourself on the foot a little bit. Oh, yeah. man. But, I mean... But good for you for going out and being proactive, because, I mean, who knows if that Fed shit would have, you know? I mean, yeah. that, and it's not like it's, take, you know, and, yeah, I don't know. The stimulus is now, I mean, is there going to be another one? I mean, people got, what, 1200 bucks. I mean, who can live off that? It's Yeah, it's certainly not going to change anyone's life. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, maybe and it will, actually. <laughs> actually, maybe it will, it, you know? Yeah. They'll maybe they didn't need to go to the food bank and now they will need to. Yeah, that's a change. Um, but yeah, I got no complaints and you know I maintained the pace of of the podcast two episodes a week still through all that time. Absolutely, it was insane. And so when it went away, I fe I feel like fucking Iron Man, dude. <laughs> like I could, I feel like I could run a marathon. Um. I have so much energy. Like I get off work and I'm like, all right, what now? What, what am I doing? Yeah. That's, that's a great feeling though. I mean, being productive, I mean, it's so validating. I mean, I, you know, it's like funny. I, I've realized, uh, just like how much, you know, so I'm writing a solo record and, um, you know, I've been working a lot in a studio at my house and sometimes I don't want to do it you know, or I don't feel like I'm inspired to do something. But as soon as you, I don't know, as soon as you sit down and put your mind to it, something will, you'll have some sort of breakthrough, right? Or you'll, you'll, something will happen that maybe you won't like in the moment, but it'll lead to something else. Or, you know, it, even if the song or the riff you write right then isn't the best thing in the world, it's, it's now out of your brain and you, it maybe will move on to something else that's amazing. And that sense of productivity, I think, has been pretty helpful during this whole quarantine for me because I'm just able to, you know, like feel like I'm being useful and creative and, you know, still producing while, you know, I'm not able to tour while, you know, all this stuff is going around me. And it's, 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 I don't know, that, that's been kind of therapeutic to me, honestly. But I mean, but I guess music has always been a certain amount of therapy for me. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Hey, yeah. I have another question. Second <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it? So, it sounds so cliche, but when you're talking about not being inspired, all of a sudden, I like I, I've swore to myself when I started doing this podcast, I was like, I was like I'm never going to ask any of those shitty questions that I would read in guitar magazines with people who are like, tell so. Tell me about the process of this record, because I've made a shitload of records and I'm like, the process, the fuck <laughs> are you talking about? But I understand more about my writing process now, if I can, if I can uh, exploit that term, probably beyond what it's in, in, intended purpose. Um, you know, I'll play, I'll have like little games that I'll play. I'll be like, imagine you know, this person uh, it reinterpreting two other things at once. If I am feeling uninspired, I'll be like, all right, and imagine Mick Ronson interpreting, you know, Metallica and whatever. And make, yeah, and make that happen. And it might not sound anything like what that would be in reality, if mm -hmm. for some ungodly reason that happened, but, <laughs> but it will, it'll eke something out of me. And do you have, like, do you have any weird games that you'll play like that to get the juices uh, flowing? I don't, not, I don't really, not really any games. I mean, I find that a lot of times, uh, you know, if I'm feeling uninspired, sometimes I'll just walk around the house with a guitar and annoy the crap out of my family, right? And just like, because <laughs> sometimes the minstrel, it's like, sometimes it's <laughs> to have it in hand to like 
to see what comes out. You know what I mean? And like the more often it's in my hand, the more likely it is that something's going to happen. Right. Right. So a lot of times, like even just like sitting on the couch watching TV, like I'll be watching, I don't know, watch a Seahawks game or watch something or whatever. And it's like, you know, uh, I mean, some of it's just accidental. Some of it's just luck, but sometimes, um, some of the best stuff comes out of, of just almost not being fully there in and not and not making it so important and like so like do or die about like i need to create something right now like i have to write a riff i have to write part of a song like sometimes being distracted like i find like i go to a different place because i'm not fully like doing what i norm like not doing my stock normal thing does that make sense yeah. like like having a distraction sometimes is a, you know, is a, is a benefit at that stage. I mean, once, and then once the initial, once an initial idea or for a song or a riff happens, then, you know, a lot of times it just like spills out of you. I don't know if you have that experience, but you know, once you, once an idea is in your head, like then it's just like game on and the floodgates kind of just, just, for sure. just are, are open, but it's, it's, you know, getting to that spark. That's the, that's the challenge. What about writing writing parts for Minus the Bear? What like what was that process like? Because your style to me like to me, I have no fucking idea how how I would go about doing something like that. It's that is a to me, that is a distinctly you thing. And so probably it's it's like speaking a sentence to you writing a part like that but does it come quarterly first then you're like okay here are the notes and here's the melody and i'm gonna tap this thing out and Uh, i mean yeah i mean a lot of times it was um you know i would i wouldn't write the whole song you know by myself like it would just be a riff that i would come up with and sometimes it would just be as simple as like barring a chord down here and then just experimenting with what would happen at the top you know um in terms of like tapping the the counter melody or whatnot. Um, sometimes I would demo out little songs and bring them in with like, you know, bad drum machine beats and have rough ideas and, you know, every, you know, and those songs generally worked out, but it, you know, it was ended up being nothing like what the demo was. Right. Um, I mean, back in the minus the Dare, bear days, I mean, there were certainly times when, you know, we got into like the whole sampling thing with the DL fours and all the triggering and stuff where, you know, I wanted to make up a song that was, you know, had cut up sounds like maybe a DJ or something would do like on an MPC, right. you know, like that samples loaded into, into like a sampler, um, you know, like someone like Fortet or Caribou or DJ shadow would make something. And, you know, that's where the DL four I found, um, kind of, uh, that's kind of where I went bananas with that. And I realized that the possibilities there were, were kind of endless. I mean, I mean, there's some constraints, I mean, there's constraints in that pedal, obviously, but, um, do you still use it? Yeah. I mean, I still, I mean, I still use those when I'm recording. Cause I, I still love some of the sound that you get when you, when, you know, when you do the, um, the double time thing and it just, and it just, you know, the, the riff is just, you know, an octave up and then it's, so much faster and, and you know, the chirpiness that you get with that and just the complexity of the, of the sound. So. Do you think that it's weird that you became known as the DL4 guy? Yeah, but I get it. (laughs) I mean, you were like the, like the ultimate like poster boy for, for that pedal. It's like, did anyone have more of them on their pedal board? I mean, I hope someone else did at some point. <laughs> someone <laughs> somewhere is in listening right now like, yeah, motherfucker, I had five. <laughs> the fifth one wasn't plugged in, but yeah, 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 yeah. there's no power supply in the world that'll take care of all that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that just became like, that just became logistical. You know right. what I mean? At, at some point when you're, when it was, when playing live and there were songs with like two samples, you know, the other two were for other songs with two samples. So it's, you know, it became kind of a logistical nightmare performing some of those songs, but that's why there were so many on, on my pedal board. And then, you know, like 
Jake and I, you know, started like playing those parts back and forth off of each other. So then he had to get, you know, he needed more and just became like a, <laughs> became an, un- it, it couldn't control itself. It like the pedals were running the show. Have you, have you explored <laughs> other, like any other of the new digital options that would replace that? I. Uh, I mean, I tried. I've tried like the uh, TC, like Ditto X4, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, some of like the Boss things. Um, yeah. I know a lot of friends that you know were into like the Akai Head Rush and those types of things, like Brian and Ryan from the Snakes. These arms are snakes. Um, I have one I of those things. Yeah, I mean, and, P- I, and I know people love those. I mean, like Don Caballero, like all those bands, you know, use use those head rushes as well. Um, I don't know the deal for like the way that it just retriggers. I mean, I just it just became like second. It just became like another like appendage. It was just like a third hand or something. You know, it just right. became that to use it. Uh, but none of the like like the uh, super heavy duty rack effects processors, like the Helix or any of. Uh, you know, I do, I have a I have the Helix floor um, floor model or whatever, um, mm-hmm. and I've kind of I. I've only barely like scratched the surface of that, honestly. Um, you know, I think a lot of times these, well, these days, because I'm not really, you know, no one's touring, but because the band, you know, neither of the bands are, are active at the moment, I'm just doing a lot more writing. So I'm not really, I'm kind of just using the tools that I've already, right. the guitar pedals that I've already used. And I'm just learning more about like software and recording and stuff. So the the whole Helix thing, I haven't totally gotten into yet, but I hear good things about that too. Yeah, I mean, all that stuff is amazing. I remember when the first pods came out, you know, thinking, "Ah, this will never fly." Yeah, it was the, the 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 way that like amp simulators sound now is so ridiculous. It's like they're so great, whether you know, like recording in the box or doing any of that stuff. It's just like the amp sounds are wild. Like I was, um, I think, guess it was a, I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago. I you know, I started recording this record with my uh, buddy Sam, who did the last minus the bear record, and we were like, he was like, we're just going to do it direct into the computer. No, we're not going to mic any amps, all this stuff. And I was like, what? How is this going to? This is going to sound like shit. It's right. going to sound like garbage. And then he like brings up these amp simulators, and it's just like, this sounds. This. Why weren't we doing this before? Um, well, that we weren't there before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, but it was like the it was like the the last experience I had with that was a pod, like you just said. You right. know, and it's like. That's not that's not gonna flow. But. There's a software version of the Helix. I was using the built, you know, like I use um, Logic. Yeah, yeah. So do I. Yeah, and the amp sounds that are that just come stock are, are good. good, and I use them for years for demos for my bands. Yeah, yeah. Um, and God, you know, here's the problem. <laughs> here's the problem within <laughs> the box effects, and I. I wouldn't say that I went like four DL fours deep, but yeah, yeah. I I did a thing because I was like, I wonder what would happen if I did this. Like I wrote a real simple, just like four chords, very yeah. straight chord thing, and um, and I put like a uh, an eighth note tremolo on it, like a hard uh, hard square wave tremolo, like that 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 that. And then I put a dotted, uh, dotted eighth note on it. Maybe it was sixteenth and dotted eighth, or, but it was almost like the U two delay thing, right? Sure. But with tremolo, and uh, and in the box, it was really cool. But then we went to go play that song live. Oh, and it's, it doesn't work, right? And and it fucking drove me crazy that I couldn't do it. it <laughs> like I spent, and I, I'm not exaggerating. I probably spent twenty five hundred dollars trying to find a solution, maybe more. Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. Trying to find the solution to be able to play this one fucking song, and it about drove me crazy. Well, that's the. Th- I mean, that's the thing with like some of the like recording, like. Like with a song that's been created in the studio, you know, you can, you can tell, uh, 
sometimes right away that it's not going to translate live. You know, like we've there's been certain like minus the bear songs that it's like they've been like studio creations and the band has been super excited about it. And then you try and play it live and it just is a absolute miserable failure. You know, it's like, you know, a lot of times it's why you need to flesh things out in a room. You know, if if it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can certainly like make a record that's just meant to be like listened to and just meant to be like a studio album. And that and that can be great. But but there's just a certain thing about some riffs and some songs that it needs to like live and breathe and you need to like have the live version like the live like a studio version falls on its face like it doesn't have the doesn't have like the guts to to translate in that environment well i bought multi-effects processors (laughs) i bought two fucking h9s oh yeah yeah and i and let me tell you something you think H9s, you connect them, they're, they're time clock locked, you tap a tempo in. You know, I had, I, I think I bought three different MIDI controllers. Um, and in the end, uh, in the end, I just forewent <laughs> it all. And I was like, I'll, I'll use a, a tap tempo and I'm going to fuck off the dotted eighth note thing. And uh, and just go between the eighth eighth note and the sixteenth note thing in the pre-chorus and drop it out and. But is it is it because that was the thing in the in that that effect made the riff right? I mean that that effect kind of made the Absolutely. song. Absolutely. And so when you can't recreate that like live, then it's like, well, what's the point of the song? The only solution that I found that worked, I had a an ideological. Um, problem with and that was to have and i (laughs) and i did this once uh i got a midi breakout box and i had brought a laptop on and it just had a click track and everything was my pedal board was locked up to that and the drummer had a click in his ear for one Mm -hmm. fucking song and because the effect drops out in the chorus and we all know chorus is speed up right yeah. And so, and then we get to the end of the chorus and I go and kick everything back on. And then the tremolo is over here and the drums are here. And it's just like, so, uh, for one show we use the computer and it went, it went better than any of the other shows, but I, I couldn't do it. I hated having a computer on stage. There, you know, Alex, our keyboardist, you know, some of these samples we were talking about with the DL4, he would be like, why don't you just have a laptop? You know, or you can, you know, we'll figure it out with my laptop and you can just have a MIDI controller that will just control your samples out of the computer. And I'm like, dude, that's cheating. Like this, this shit has to be done live. You know what I mean? Like those samples also aren't going to have like the unique like characters, the characteristics of it happening live. It's going to sound stale. It's not going to sound exciting. Like when you sample something live and it's done in that moment, like it has an energy about it rather than just like taking something that was off a studio recording and just triggering that, you know, it's like, it loses the magic. So I totally, I totally understand your, why you hated the computer thing. And for people who, who know what's happening, it, it makes all the difference. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. it's night and day. Yeah. Right. Cause they, if, if, cause if they're, they're, they're hoping to see that realism, right. You know, they don't want to just see like a DJ that's up on stage hitting the play, but play bar, you know, it's like, what's, what's fun about that. There's also a, a, an element of danger to that. Cause oh. you're like, maybe, uh, maybe it's not going to be awesome, but maybe it's going to be better than any other time. Total. I mean, I, going back to your very first question, are there things, you know, like you've done wrong <laughs> with learning? I mean, certain samples and recording them live on the fly. Like sometimes you just like, there's just ones that are just hard to do, but right. the danger aspect of it. And the, like the, like, you know, you mentioned as well is what makes it exciting. And when it hits, it's so great. And then other times it doesn't hit. And you know what? It's, it's fine. And the show goes on and maybe it wasn't perfect, but I'd rather have it be, a little bit off than have it be so sterile that it's like perfectly right. on constantly. That has, that's, that's the opposite of what live music's supposed to be. And the thing is, 
you will probably, maybe, <laughs> certainly not always. I've definitely not always been my worst critic. There have been people who have been worse critics of me <laughs> than myself. But typically, you're your own worst critic, right? Absolutely. Because the, the, you know, the audience, they're so excited to see you. They're forgiving. You know, if, if I mess up a sample and it's not perfectly played, whatever, they're having a blast. Uh, have you always felt like that or was there ever, did you have to go through a stretch of time where you just punished yourself after shows? Oh yeah, if- oh, yeah absolutely. And it's like one of those things, I, this is a cliche, absolutely true, but it's like, you know, you, everyone's going nuts, but I'll like focus on the one person in the front that's like yawning. Right. You know what I mean? Or like they're, they Checking got pulled, their texts. <laughs> yeah. They, they got pulled there by their friend or their significant other. And <laughs> you, right. you know, like, I'm like, I'm just trying, come on. Like everyone's having fun. Why can't you just like crack a smile or why can't you just like look like you're don't want to kill yourself? Come on. That's when you pull out the confetti gun and the, <laughs> and the t-shirt gun. And yeah, like, I will, I will make you have fun. <laughs> you go full Weedle on them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, but I mean, I, yeah. Being your own worst critic is definitely a, a post-show nightmare sometimes but then you know you just gotta you just gotta remember that it's rock and roll it's meant to be fun it's right. it if everything doesn't go exactly right who cares you right. know as long as you tried to do as long as you did your best everyone had had a good time right that's a hard lesson for me to learn totally yeah for sure uh you had to do a lot of tap dancing how yep. I mean, how and this, of course, is a as much of a style as as anything, right? So you have both your hands happening in like you know more uh, intricate ways than most most people are attuned to playing, and you're tap dancing on your pedal board. Yeah, how like how. What first of all, what a crazy evolution of of your style and and if could you have imagined that in ninety five? No, 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 not at all. I mean I don't I mean I think I maybe had one you know, everyone starts with one pedal, right? A tuner or yeah. like a distorted pedal or Hopefully whatever. Hopefully a tuner. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Although sometimes not even that, man. Right. You know? <laughs> Those painful tuning pauses between songs with your bass player and oh man um but yeah i mean it uh, there yeah there's no way that i would have imagined that that's the level it would have gotten to obviously um but yeah i mean the pedal board became its own instrument you know at a certain point and right you know it, it was kind of just um another way to i guess i've always wanted to have my guitar playing be considered unique when you know like special to me um you know, and like, I wanted to, I guess, have a style. And so that was one way to, was to do that, you know, cause a lot of the sounds that I think I was trying to emulate weren't really sounds that you could just make by strumming a A minor, or, you know, like doing a standard, you know, arpeggio or something. Um, whether it was the, the tapping stuff or the pedal board, I think there was always a desire to like make my guitar sound like a keyboard or make my guitar sound like something different i think that's part of the one of the fun things about the guitar is that it's so malleable in that way with the pedals you know yeah. you can you can make it unique with any number of things put together or or just a different technique that you know maybe you do different than other than other folks when did you start playing the prs guitars uh that i mean i got my first prs i bought Right before, I guess right after the Minus the Bear started, um, but it was before Botch broke up. And and I remember like we had rehearsed Minus the Bear like maybe a couple days before the last Botch show. And Matt Bale, is, our keyboardist at the time, was like, you better not play that PRS live because you know it's going to get broken into a million pieces at the last Botch show. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, it was kind of like, it must have been like 2002, 2001. Um but yeah, I mean, there's just something about them that I, 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 I don't know. They just, they just feel so natural. 
Um, well, the necks are incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, it's, and that's probably why I gravitated towards it for the for the tapping, just because the ease of playing and the accessibility of the frets and the neck being amazing and you know being able to get the action nice and low, but still <clears throat> sound great. You know, without without all the buzzing and all the other crap that comes with low action. I was really late to the game uh, with PRS, and I didn't. I didn't really appreciate them until I was working at a guitar store and, um, and they were a PRSD. It was a, the guitar store up on Aurora. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they're a PRS dealer. <clears throat> and, uh, I remember when James brought him in, I was like, what are you doing? Really? You know? And he's like, no, dude, listen, just forget I mean, whatever, whatever it is you're thinking forget yeah. it and and play one and hang out with one for a while and uh he brought a couple in and then he brought in a gold dgt and i was mm -hmm. like oh that's interesting yeah. and that and then the s2s came out and i bought one and i bought a baritone oh, an nice. se i still <laughs> have it it's i mean it's incredible i still have a few of them and then i ended i mean i ended up working for them Oh, you did? Yeah. I, I was like, I was, I was in, I was like, I was sold. And I, I worked for them until I moved to New York and there, there just wasn't a job here for me. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think they kind of get stereotyped into a certain, <clears throat> you know, like crowd of music. I think and that's, some, that's turning. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think some of the, um, I mean, some of the finishes can be a little wild. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think both those things maybe, you know, initially if someone sees the guitar, they're like, what is that? Or, you know, you associate it with like, I don't know, like Nickelback or something that, right. you know what I mean? Like people that you, you know, a band that you don't necessarily like, but, um, but yeah, a I mean, lot I of just, people, a lot, a lot of shitty bands play uh, Les Pauls too, but Les Pauls are great. Right. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say this thing. <laughs> they play Strat and Telecasters yeah. and SGs. <laughs> right. You know, like, yeah. So uh, did they ever build you a private stock? Uh not a no, not a private stock, but they were they were, you know, really uh generous about um about getting me guitars and yeah. you know and those S twos. I I did a few ads with them for that and then a couple of the um amps I did a few ads with. I went to uh, NAM. They brought me to, down to NAM maybe in like 2015 or something like that and so i did a showcase there and did a q a and did stuff like that um they were always really nice and uh went to the factory a few times and and all that stuff but the factory is pretty amazing that's incredible yeah that was like um i was already really into it but when i went out there for my interview that was kind of like yeah that sealed the deal yep. i was like i'm getting this job yeah. <laughs> what was your what was the uh, what was the title oh i i was the like uh west i covered the west coast and i did sales oh nice yeah so uh it was fun it was a fun fun gig oh, i bet yeah and I, st I still have friends over there yeah yeah you know like rich and uh god who else who's the uh i don't know there's a, there's a lot of people over there rich and bev are the ar folks yeah yeah but yeah i dealt mostly with this like on the sales side of, you know and then some builders right right um but yeah i have a dg amp the dg30 oh okay i don't i haven't played that one i love it i love it that sanzera is cool though is that the amp that you did a thing i think i feel like i saw a video of you playing the sanzera yeah yeah and it, let me and I mean, I, I, and I use that live in combination with my twin, um, out of, you know, a stereo situation live for a few years. Yeah. Um, uh, but the, I gotta say like, even uh, like the production models sound good, but the prototype that they did, that they sent me yeah. is like one of my favorite amps, like the Sunzera, like 30 watt, like prototype head. Yeah. Like it just sounds so killer. I actually ended up using it on the last Minus the Bear record on like I don't know a ton of the songs, but there's just something about that that prototype that just is like the sweet spot. I don't know if it's just 
because it's not the production model. It's like got some extra components in it that are a little right. different than the stock production model. But man, it's like just sings. That thing was coming for a long time. And I've seen some pretty interest, you know, I still drive down to Maryland occasionally to deliver coffee. And on the, I haven't stopped in, well, at all this year because, you know, this year is pretty screwballs. Exactly. Um, but I was stopping in and saying hello, you know, every time I was down there for the last couple of years. And I've seen some interesting prototypes. They're cool. There's some really cool shit coming. Yeah, didn't they, uh, didn't they have someone that was like, was there someone from Fender working on an amp there that they, they were, cause they were trying to make a clean amp for a long time because they had all the high gain stuff. Right. Uh, I think they're, they're working on a lot of stuff. I mean, I don't want to, I guess I, don't, I probably, since we're recording, we're going to release this. I don't want to like yeah, yeah, I give hear up uh, any insider this, trading secrets, sure, sure. <laughs> but there's some fucking like pretty crazy. I don't know if they'll ever see the light of day, but some really interesting guitar drawings i've seen wow interesting and wow. and i'm like every time i talk to uh my friends there I'm a i ask about it and every time they say well you know maybe next year maybe fourth quarter of next year and then the next <laughs> yeah next yeah yeah and i'm like year. hey what about that thing <laughs> what about that thing yeah i mean i was I was pressing them forever to make a like the DG15 combo. Mm -hmm. Cuz this thing, I mean it's a beast. You you, uh, you uh you can't see it. But, you know, it's the 212 and the and the head and it's just like, you know, when I was in when I was living in Brooklyn, like I couldn't take that to a gig. I'm sure. taking a cab or taking the train. I got a double gig bag and a pedal board, and I use the backline amp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I showed up in Brooklyn. I had an SVT and an AC30, and I was like fourth floor walk up, you know, no <laughs> elevator, and I was like, yeah. oh, this this isn't working. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is not working. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have uh, I have not gone deep down there like the modeler rabbit hole cuz I'm not I'm not gigging but I'm recording. Yeah. So I got one of those aux things. Oh, the UA aux box? Yeah. Is it awesome? It's well, here's the thing. Yes, <laughs> it's awesome. But the problem with the aux is Right at the point, I got it right at the point where I, I looked around and I'm, I look at this and I think to myself, I mean, I like guitars. I could get another guitar. I don't need another guitar. Like I have, I have everything that I need to do what I want, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know... I get the ox and now I'm like, Oh, well fucking a, I could, now I got to buy some amps. <laughs> and, uh, let me tell you, that's a real motherfucker because yeah. <laughs> amps are also like the amps that I want. You know, I, I'm not, that's it. yeah. Yeah. Like I want an old fucking super lead, you know, I want a super yeah. lead. They're not cheap. Not even the, like, fakes or you know whatever the the replica or whatever yeah yeah, yeah the knockoffs <laughs> you know and because they're all you know hand wired by someone and they they gotta get I mean, i'm not knocking anyone for building uh uh oh, no, not at all they gotta get paid but so does the ox do any sort of emulation the ox is a it does or is it it's just a direct speaker or what is it Exactly. It's a, uh, so, you know, I'm going to say a bunch of words that I don't really know what they mean right now. <laughs> <laughs> like a true salesman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is a, uh, 
a load. Sure. Fucking something or other. Load impedance, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, you can you can plug an amp into it, and then not run a speaker at all, right. and then run an output from that into your interface, and it will uh, take the amp load so you don't blow your amp up. Yeah. And it emulates speaker cabinets. Right. Okay. That's the emulation part that I was. Okay. Yeah. 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 Here's the thing that I don't understand about all that stuff. Like, I don't understand what impulse response things are, these IRs. I don't uh, understand like that shit. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if that's something that I'm supposed to do to this also, because it sounds great to me. Maybe they're already there. I don't know the difference. That's the, you know. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, the impulse response. Like, one of my buddies just got a, one of those Kemper profiling amps. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he swears by that thing. I mean, he's just, you know, um, sounds amazing recorded. And the, you know, the fact that you can just like put the mic or whatever up in front of any speaker and just like save that response and then just have that was, I mean, that's just like mind boggling to me. Like those people are so head and shoulders above me in intelligence. <laughs> How does that work? Does it like, do you plug it in? Does it make a loop and like blow some crazy, like uh old, fashion modem sounds through there and speak some digital voodoo that's a good question i don't know how it i don't know what tone or whatever i don't know what you use to get the the response and but it must be something like that right i mean it seems crazy to me like okay plug into that amp and play crazy train and now <laughs> you know like that doesn't make sense to me like that seems like a terrible idea and it seems like you'd be setting your product up to fail because right. you don't know what quality a mic someone's going to have. You don't know what the room is going to, you know, it's like all sure. the yeah. things that go into recording. So many variables. Yeah. But what the fuck do I know? Seriously. I mean, <laughs> I'm with you, dude. <laughs> uh, so tell me about what what's going on with the record that you're making. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know the band, you know, both bands are inactive, you know, like well broken up or whatever. So, you know, I've always wanted to do a solo record, you know, with minus the bear, it's awesome. So many great experiences, but sometimes, you know, there's just five dudes constantly. Sometimes it's just, you want to do your own thing. So, of course. um, about a year ago, I started working on this record. Like I said, with Sam, who did the last, Sam Bell, who did the last Minds of Bear record. Um, and I've had some of these songs for a while. So we started tracking at a studio in Seattle called Avast. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Of um, but so so we started tracking there, and we you know did a few songs, and then you know we're in this like huge studio, you know, and I have you know every, you know everything set up or whatever. But we're just really in the control room, and it's like, well, what are we doing here? So. Did yeah, we could do. This. Did Avast? Uh, is it on like eighty, eighty third, eighty second, eighty third? Is it that place? Yeah, it's on eightieth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that place is crazy. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I love that studio. It used to be something else, right? It belonged to an old dude who just had stacks of shit everywhere. I don't, I don't know the whole history of it, but Avast, I mean, Avast originally was down in like Wallingford. Yeah. And then I don't know at what point, must have been early 2000s, it moved to, to the place on 80th. But, but yeah, there's like the A room and the B room there. And um, yeah, I mean, that place is, I mean, it's also like five blocks from my house. So that's pretty <laughs> nice. So it's pretty convenient. You can um, uh, ride, skateboard over to Gordito's and then. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so it's uh, so we started recording there, but we realized that we did that was just we didn't need all that. Um, when we realized we could just do it in my house, so we turned a room in my house into a studio, um, and then started working on it. We kind of finished what I thought was going to be the record um, back in like January, but then I just through this whole pandemic and even after, and even before that, after the record was quote unquote finished, you know, it's on a whole instrumental record. I just kept writing and writing. Um, and so now I feel like, you know, this, the five or six songs that I've written since then are just so much better than any of that other stuff. So, um, so now we're kind of in the middle of, uh, finishing up these, this other 
batch of songs and we'll we'll figure out what's going to be on the record and what's not um and now the idea is i have like five or six um vocalists that are going to come in um and guest on different songs so it'll be about half instrumental and half with um with friends that i've you know made over the years touring and whatnot from various bands are going to help contribute to uh mick jagger yeah exactly mick jagger you know you got tyler the edge i mean bono yeah. Yeah, you, <laughs> whichever one of those guys i don't know one of those guys sings guys you know yeah yeah never um, heard of them <laughs> so yeah exactly so i mean it's been it's been really fun it's um you know it hopefully hopefully people will will dig it but um i don't know hopefully it'll come out next year what stylistically where does it fall in the evolution of what you mm. are known for doing I mean, it's kind of a mixture of, you know, I've always loved, um, you know, like really big, fat, distorted beats. So there's definitely a lot of that going on that I've written, a lot of drum beats that are kind of manipulated and fucked up. Um, and then, uh, God, how do you even describe it? I mean, there's there's some songs that are kind of dancey um, with, with, you know, still some of the sampling stuff. And then there's a lot of like more soundscapey more like theatrical like big epic um epic tunes that just kind of like are a whole like atmosphere not atmospheric in terms of like minimalism but they just have cinematic yeah exactly they have a lot of you know yeah that cinematic quality going for them i don't know it's hard for me to explain i mean i hate talking about my own music no i know it's it's terrible but i i felt like i had to pry a little bit yeah yeah no i hear you i mean there's it, it, you'll you'll know that it's me, but it's a, it's a different you know it's it's a different project, so it's it's unique unto itself. Right. Uh, and were the were these distorted drum beats were they cut with real drums? Is there a drummer playing? On no, them? I mean there's there's like um, <clears throat> drum loops, yeah. um, names brought in, um, and then just a lot of like program drums that we've just manipulated and. Stuff like that. We we talked about having a live drummer come in, but um, but I don't know. At this point, I I kind of dig the way it sounds, and it's fun to have it be completely different than a lot of the other stuff that I've worked on in the past. So, you know, a lot of the stuff might be things that I wanted to do with other bands previously, but we didn't. Other people weren't into, right. or you know, we it just it, it just didn't fit the the vibe of that of that band or project. Sure. Yeah. Do you have any intention of, I mean, obviously it's not even an option right now, but do you have any intention of supporting it live, touring yeah. it somehow? Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, and kind honestly, of- like, I was getting pretty nervous about doing that kind of stuff. And I was getting like antsy, like before the pandemic started. And I was like, I need to figure out, and you know, I need to like book a tour. I need to like start figuring this out. I need to get this record out there. Um but ultimately, like in terms of like the record, I feel like the whole slowdown of the music has like let me kind of like it's alleviated that pressure. And so now I'm just like focusing on getting like whatever the best material is on the record instead of kind of almost rushing it out too soon. So that whole pause is kind of think kind of helped will help make it the best it could be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It so. sounds like. You could, all, I mean, sounds like you could tour this with a two-piece band. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guitars. I would, I need another guitarist. Right. <laughs> yeah. Three. And piece. it's, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. There's got to be a there's got to be someone playing drums. Though. I can't. I like it's funny. I go to a show and like the person I latch onto, the person I want to watch is the drummer. You know. So it's funny that you bring it up because I've talked about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, and that is that if your drummer sucks, your band sucks. Oh, absolutely. So true. It's just, it's really, it's that simple. If it's a drummer, non-star. I mean, you can have great songs, but sorry, your band sucks if your drummer sucks. Yep. I'm on, I'm on board with you 100%, dude. <laughs> I end up, yeah, I end up latching on to drummers a lot and seeing shows. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think drummers, I mean, I don't know, there's something about guitarists that just, they love, 
I mean, I've wanted to be a drummer for a while, you know, like, I think like everybody wants to be a drummer at some point. Right. And so that's, you know, you're just enamored by the, <laughs> I think by, yeah, by what you do. it's almost like I obviously am a frustrated, all guitarists are frustrated drummers because the yeah. drummer drives everything. And really the and guitar players are up in the front faking, like, look at yeah, me, yeah. I'm driving the ship. Right. They're like the second mate, really the skippers yeah. in the back. <laughs> But uh, it's funny, I'm just kind of making this realization. Your desire to be a drummer has manifested itself into you actually using all four limbs in your guitar playing. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe like one of the only guitar players who has fully realized their, their desire to drum in their guitar playing. Well, yeah, and I mean, even if you go to, like, the tapping element, like, you know, the opposing, like, rhythms of tapping on the on the, on the the fretboard. I mean, I guess it's my inner my inner drummer trying to get out, right? That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Have you, do you own a drum kit? Uh, I used to, but um, I don't anymore. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I There was one at the house for a while, and I told myself I was going to learn it you know, learn how to play. But then it's like, I don't know. I felt the need to write songs for the band instead of goofing off on drums. <laughs> I think, you know, I've owned a few drum kits and yeah. also, and also lived in homes where there are drum kits. And I always, anytime, like if there was a, in the nineties, I lived up on 12th Avenue in one of those, like, you know, if you come up, one of them was kind of like a legendary punk rock house before I lived there. Then it got really uncool when I moved in. Um, it was, if you're coming up John and you turn left on 12th, there were, and it's fucking gone now. I buried my cat in the backyard and I know they bulldozed my cat's grave. Uh. Fucking, and every time I drive by, it drives me fucking crazy. But if you turn left there, uh, there were like two big, beautiful Victorian houses. One was restored and one was a trash fire. And I lived in the trash fire. Um, but it was a band house. There was a drum kit down in the basement. And I would always go down. I'm a terrible drummer, but I would insist on going down there and try, yeah. to, try to improve. I'm, yeah. I mean, it's just so, I don't know. There's it's just something draws you to it, right? I mean, you just the, the human nature to want to bang on shit, you know, and like see, you know, see what see what you can do on it. It's a uh, the most naturally physical. Like you can make everything else very physical. Yep. You know, you can make everything hard for yourself uh, by thrashing around, and you can make thing. You can make. You know, I've talked about this some where I would. I would know there was a very easy path to writing a part for a song, right? It's like, okay, here's a real simple chord progression. I have this very easy path laid out for me, but I don't want to, right? Yeah. So what would I do? I would I would make it hard for myself and I would, you know, even if I was playing something relatively simple, I would find the difficult way to execute to the simple thing. Because I liked the tension. I, sure. I mean, I, I liked it. But yeah. you don't have to worry about that with drumming. It's just fucking hard. Unless you're, <laughs> unless you're some sort of freak natural. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't. I'm a terrible. I keep threatening that I'm going to get a drum kit and throw it in here, but. You should. My house is small. I can't. I mean, I don't even really have room for an electronic drum kit, and plus, they're kind of dorky. I mean, it's if it's if it's what you can do, then it's what you can do. Right. I mean, it's definitely not the best option. But. We're out here in the country, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a little studio barn. Um, just, you get your drum shed going on, you know? Drum room. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, uh, can we pause for a second? Yeah, man. Okay. I just need to go to the bathroom real quick. Yeah, yeah, do it. Hope you had a hell of a piss, Arnold. 
Hello? Are you muted? Uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I just made a Fast Times at Ridgemont High joke, and, and you didn't even hear it because I, I was muted. I didn't hear it, dude. What was it? It was the, you know, hope you had a hell of a piss, Arnold. A classic. <laughs> Love a it. Classic. Yeah. Um. Earlier, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to hash on uh, technology and sort of the thing that I'm surprised about 2020 is that, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention, right? And it's like, so far, the the fucking coolest thing that 2020 has given us is like group chat, like gr- group video chat. Like that shit ha- was happening five years ago. I um, And so I'm kind of waiting to see maybe next year there is going to be an explosion of technological advancement because people have had some time to focus. Totally. <clears throat> Perhaps. I mean, I, I can't imagine that there will ever be a time where like where two people could without any latency perform music together in a chat. I, I just, I can't see that happening. That seems a little far out. Yeah, <clears throat> but I mean, you know, like some kind of weird uh, Obi One shit, where like I all of a sudden I'm like standing on your desk, you know, like you want, little... you want some hologram action? Is that what yeah, you're looking? Yeah, yeah, I'm looking for some like, uh, you know, yeah, hologram would be cool. What about a hologram? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how useful it is, but yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's kind of, a, I mean, yeah, like Zoom. I mean, what was that's that's like the thing that's happening. That's what's come out of this whole pandemic. I mean, that was already here, but yeah, you're right. There's got to be something that that's um, that people are working on right now, right? I mean, look, Zoom group chats are like it says it would be like if a car manufacturer was like. It's got power windows. It's like, it fucking better have power windows. This is 2020. Are you fucking yeah. kidding me? I'm not cranking my window down. Get the Seriously. fuck out of here with that car. That's the, that's that's what you're going to push? I don't know. What do you think yeah. they got coming for us? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's funny you bring this up. So I was talking to my wife about this the other day because she works uh, at Adobe and they're doing a lot of, you know, like, you got some inside. I mean, well, they're like in, <laughs> in the research department and like, you know, there's all this like AI and machine learning stuff. And so there's, you know, like people in the audio department that are trying to, you know, use AI to create music and, you know, and all this stuff. And so I guess they're having a lot of conversations about um, is a song created with artificial intelligence, you know, is that really music or is that just an algorithm that's coming up with you know is that just a computer experiment right because at some point they'll be able to make a song that fits whatever mood you want like at the drop of a hat right just like with an algorithm and with machine learning it'll well is every person's creative process just an evolving algorithm unique to the themselves i mean i don't i mean i don't want to get too fucking westworld but uh i mean really they're gonna use ai to make music it's bad enough that they took the fucking cashiers away at the grocery store now they want to take musicians like the the next the uh the one tier down from uh on the pay scale from cashiers like they're just not (laughs) Like, I mean, why don't they enough? start at the top? Stick AI in uh, uh, in the White House, like yes. that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, haven't and you know, like musicians haven't they had enough taken away from them from you know, like royalties to now not being able to tour to you know, any number of things. It's like, oh, come on, at least like uh, writing a song is a human experience. You know, can we like not let the robots take over this? this function of humanity. I feel like I heard, I feel like I read, um, maybe it was like a Vox article or something. Like there was an article where, 
some algorithm wrote a song, wrote lyrics for a song. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm sure. And it and it was like, you know, a combination of the most used words. Um, of it, maybe it was stylistic. I feel like I've seen a couple of them. There was one where it was like, here is a an ACDC song. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to, this is a terrible, this is terrible radio. I don't have any of the details. I just have all the fucking obtuse flat information. Uh, This is (laughs) not to riff too much on it, but it's like the debate. (laughs) You know, I didn't, I I, I didn't see any of it. I was out with Alex getting sushi and I was so the right thing. I was so pleased to not experience it. And then I opened up Twitter and it was just like, uh, yeah, here's the thing. You did the right thing. You know, that sticker that says, uh, if, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. You know, that if you're what that bumper sticker that, you know, it's been around for years. It's like, if you're not outraged, you're not paying oh, attention. Yeah, yeah. I thought about yeah, that yeah. today. I thought about that. However, you know, outrage is like, that's everyone is fucking mad. Everyone is mad, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and that that's that's the problem. I mean, probably people people want an excuse to be mad. Not that things aren't fucked up. Things are fucked up. Things yeah, are I'm really probably, fucked up. Yeah, absolutely. But now more than ever, um, they're being pummeled. Like if people were living, you know. It just they say ignorance is bliss if people are just like cruising along through life you know uh living a life of privilege or whatever they're like eh, whatever but now you don't have a choice you're just like waka waka hey uh this everyone's got something to be mad about now and and now that bumper sticker it's like i don't know now now it's now it's funny to me that bumper sticker is is funny because for some reason I watched that debate and it's the first and last debate that I will watch yeah. um because I wasn't outraged at all I wasn't even surprised by what happened like I I fell right asleep afterwards cuz it happens late here and sure. without <laughs> even thinking about it again, just like well, that didn't well, I mean, bl- that didn't blow my mind at all. Yeah, it seems like I mean I, I didn't see it, but every clip I've seen just sounds like it was to be expected. I mean, that's how. I mean, what other way would it have turned out? Uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's. <laughs> uh, I feel yeah, like I feel, uh, I feel like I saved myself a bunch of uh, headache by missing it. So. You did the right thing. You really, really did. And and, st- and stay the course. Yeah. <laughs> stay the course. Um, I think that I, I think I want to wrap it up and try to eat because I, I went to work this morning early and, and it's, uh, it's nine thirty. Whoa. It's nine thirty. It's nine thirty here now. And, uh, nope. uh, and, uh, I'm a mess. Dude, you, you got all that maple syrup you got to, like, clean off? and <laughs> No, I did it, dude. Twice I did that, man. And it's like, uh, I mean, I was, I, I'm up on, like, a rolling ladder case. You know, it's, like, basically a rolling st- staircase. And dumping all this maple into this giant stainless steel, like, whole, like 500-gallon cylinder thing, like, at a brewery type of thing. And just, like, the first time I heard it hit the hit the floor, and I was like, "Oh man!" And then the second time, I wasn't even mad. I just, I laughed, but I knew I was gonna be running tight. Uh, I didn't clean up all the way at work. The floor is a little dirty at work, but I'll go in early and clean up. It'll be all right. Um, I really appreciate you uh, hanging out and and uh, talking with me. Yeah, no, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It, it's uh, I feel like people on Twitter were trying to connect us, so I'm glad it. Uh, I'm yeah. glad it worked. I'm really glad uh, 
you and your your family are are healthy and and safe. I know that you're probably very happy that the smoke is gone. Oh yeah, the uh, smoke was intense, but yeah, now we can go outside again. So that's <laughs> that was another thing that 2020 was like. Oh hey, now you've been stuck at your house. Now you can't go outside your house. Right. Get stoked. <laughs> now, now back to the regular scheduled shitty 2020. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I'm excited to hear the solo record. Yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't able to explain it better, but it it'll speak for itself. When once it's done, you'll uh, I'll I'll make sure you, I'll make sure it comes your way. Awesome. Yeah, I would I'd love that. I'd love that. You got it. I'm gonna um, actually I'm gonna turn this recorder off. You want to say goodbye? Thanks for listening. <laughs> I appreciate it, Mike. <laughs>